great life. <laughs> Welcome, Susanna. Now you have um, an interesting history. For those who don't know Susanna, she did used to be in BDM land many, many years ago for some of the big corporates like Macquarie. I won't mention any of the other <laughs> agri companies you may or may not have been with. <laughs> Now, <laughs> Susanna, um, I will get you can introduce yourself a little further, but she's talking about managing our little monsters and how clear values can help tame teams. So please take it away, Suzanne. <laughs> Thanks. Um, first of all, Andy, thank you very much for your presentation. There were uh, quite a few interesting points in there and probably a few beautiful links to what it is I would like to talk about. Um, but interestingly, when you talked about... Um, money certainly not creating happiness after a certain point I heard somebody beautifully say once that money makes you more just of what you already are so if you're a happy person more money will make you more happy if you're if you're a miserable person more money will make you more of that so uh, certainly sort of aligns with that um, as Amanda outed me <laughs> I do have a financial services background I didn't always work in uh, funds management. I did work in the banking and finance sector, mostly for ANZ Bank here in Australia before that for the Commerzbank in Bremen um, because I am German originally, but, um, but obviously I have lost most of my accent. But in the last 12 years, I've dedicated my life more specifically to working with probably the hardest uh, kind of team to work with, which is the family team within family businesses. So from a background perspective, I do come from a family business as well. And I understand what it's like to be working within complex dynamics. And so um, working in those kind of frameworks certainly gives you great schooling when it's when you're trying to work out how you can help humans have a better workplace. So when you're listening into this, I guess you can look at it from two perspectives. One is you probably have team members and sometimes wonder why they're behaving the way they do and how you can possibly motivate them and why are they just not doing what you want them to do. But the other one is also from your client's perspective, in particular, when you do have families in business who you're advising, uh, because from my experience, and I have been helping quite often with implementation, is that the succession financial plan is actually objectively uh, quite correct, but the human element just can't cope with the implementation mechanism, mostly on the back of how the team is actually interacting. Um, as Amanda mentioned, I look at values, and it's interesting because Andy, of course, also talked about personal values as being just one of the tools that's quite fundamental in aligning uh, humans, and there's a really good reason for that. So as humans, we, we are very much um, reliant or we have a desire to, to be part of a team, so our need to be have purpose and belonging within the team that we're part of, and also to feel that we're adding value is incredibly strong. Um, and so by having social brains and fundamentally wanting to belong, we're also very, very um, sensitive to our social context. So what I find fascinating when you look at neuroscientific kind of research is that as much as we often dismiss people's emotions and we keep talking about how they don't belong in the workplace and we're asking people to leave them outside, the reality is that social pain that we experience in our groups is actually experienced in the same way that we experience physical pain. Just for sensitive people, they do tend to experience this a whole lot more strongly. Um, and it actually is often um, much more vividly remembered. So what you tend to find is that when you have disconnect between um, team members or when they're being triggered and are, are feeling threatened within your own team, it has quite significant repercussions. And what is staggering is really that what we're not giving credit to is that most humans are in team environments uh, do struggle on a daily basis. And there are plenty of examples when you think about your teams where you've got people misbehaving uh, and you're wondering why that is that when you get to the bottom of it is that they perhaps felt excluded or they felt threatened um, as much as they're not able to, to articulate this. Often where we feel socially excluded are areas, and if you look at the SCARF model, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, it's often around status. So and I talked about before, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, Andy talked about the importance of having our fundamental needs met for us to feel safe. Above that really sits this necessity to feel purpose and belonging to the team for us to feel comfortable and this need for adding value. And the SCARF model really looks at how that gets disrupted. So, our status really looks at the importance or the, the sense of importance relative to others within the team. The concept of certainty that we have within our daily lives, so we need some clarity to be able to function well. 
the autonomy and sense of control over our own events in life, so that includes in the workplace. Relatedness, which is really a sense of connection and security with other people around you and the concept of fairness. So it's just this non-biased exchange between people. So when you have people working together, every single day when they're coming into the office, they're experiencing these relationships and they might find that they're being hurt by inadvertently by the interactions with their team members. So these five domains really influence a wide range of human emotions that we experience. And so it's a, it's a model really to create um, common language first and foremost to understand what people trigger on, but then also looking at, well, how can we use values to create common language for people not to feel excluded or included? Because as mentioned, our brains are in fact social brains and we have the strong need to belong, but every brain is different. So if we know that people trigger around fairness, for example, then if fairness means something different to me than compared to what it means to you, how do we even create a framework for teams to decide what's fair um, in the absence of any conversations around this? So it's the beautiful thing about being human beings. We are all individuals. We're all different. We all have individual brains. We all experience life differently. And yet we spent no time to put some clarity around this. So you know, yay for working with a whole team of individuals. Um, so you're probably not surprised when you reflect on um, team members and people complaining about what's being fair and others not being able to understand why this is being fair or not fair. So whilst the emotional response might be unjustified in your eyes or in your team members eyes, um, there probably is value in aligning what this really means um, and to remove sources of friction. And I guess what I would be curious about is how many of you have values within your businesses? Just to, if anybody wants to throw any out there, Amanda, yes, I'm not going to ask you because I know you do. <laughs> is there anybody else who would like to share their values? Do, do we not do this interactive? Sorry, Amanda, am I breaking the rules? Just as an example, so for integrity and loyalty, by the way, are, are tend to be values that I see quite often. But if you actually ask your team members to describe what that meant and how they're supposed to be behaving under that, you probably find that you're not going to get an answer. And so what this means is that you're putting an overlay of, of what we have in common in front of people, things that we can rely on, but no really, nobody really means knows what that means. And people tend to create their own frameworks. So one thing you can really do to create a common sense and a common language for your team is to run a workshop where you really start addressing what you believe the core values are. So get those posters out that you've got and make sure that every team member has the opportunity to provide their own shortlist and, and work as a team to really distill you know, those values if you haven't already got them. And then start having conversations around what actions do you feel are in line with your values and why does this matter to us? So what kind of behavior do we believe is in line with our values? And what kind of behavior do we not believe is in line with it? And how you really view and use values at that point is that when you have to pull people up or when you have performance conversations, you're making it about their activity or their behavior not being in line with values. You're not making it about them being bad people because quite often um, people just don't understand what, they, what it is that they're doing wrong. So help them aligning with the team and help them understanding what it is that your team stands for and how you really want them to interact. Another thing that you can do once you review those values after six months or 12 months to make sure they're actually accurate and people can live in line with them and they're actually understanding what it means is for them to bring images that reflect for them what it means to live in line with those values because some people are more verbal, Others are a little bit more image driven. So you're really finding it, e they're finding it easy to understand what you're expecting of them. And make sure you keep your values as part of your meetings and your performance reviews. So again, as I mentioned saying, Peter, you know, you've been a valuable team member on a financial performance, you've been this. Um, when you do this, it isn't quite in line with our values. I would love for you to improve, you know, your standing within the team by doing this a little bit more. So it takes some of the threat out of um, how people feel that they're being evaluated. Again, Andy talked about before work-life balance, but the reality is you know, 
our work team is part of our family and making sure we understand how we relate to them, that we belong and that we share values and we know how to behave is one thing how you can start creating a bit more peace around their brain activity so they're not constantly going into fight, fight, please. Um, as mentioned before, we're also, you know, brains are very different and differently constructed. And what I feel quite valuable is the concept of actually, instead of masking emotions to give people the chance to reflect on what's going on for them and having a framework of open sharing, I know that that can be a little bit confronting and probably for many counterintuitive to what we've learned is that what happens when people show up in your workplace and they've had a stressful morning at work or they've had some financial pressures or something happened on the way into work, um, they will be experiencing a whole range of emotions before they even show up. So what we've been taught, certainly I have been taught in corporate and in big parts of my career is that you're not supposed to share that, you're supposed to mask it. By masking it, we're losing 70% of our cognitive ability to be able to problem solve. And I think for all of us who've turned up with a lot of stress, we know that we keep trying to solve problems and we're not able to show up how we need to show up. If you create an environment where people can share how they feel about something, they get back 50% of that cognitive ability that they've lost before. And it's again, it's found in neuroscience. It has a lot to do with being able to share threats. Uh, probably more um, useful when you're a zebra and there's a line and you have to let other zebras know that lines are bad for you. And of course, so these are some of the overhangs that we have to work through. <laughs> there are not too many lines of crocodiles or tigers usually. Um, but it is a really useful construct. So with a lot of teams I work with, I try to teach them to come in in the morning and take ownership of how they feel and reflect on, on their position. And it might be as simple as, I'm feeling stressed today because my child is sick. And really what that does is there's nobody who has to fix anything, but what it's done is remove that, that pressure. There's no need to mask. And what it's also doing, it's allowing other people in the team to now make informed choices to how they respond to that person within their team. So I saw a lady talking about this in an interesting concept called the puffer fish. So you've, caught, you've come into the office and you're really stressed and something happens and you go, and you sort of <laughs> stress response. And so what happens next is that nobody else knows this and you've been masking that. So you're not very efficient and you're probably not in a good space. The next person walks up to you and says, have you got that report for me? And what do I go? I told you I'll have it later. And that person goes, what have I done? What's wrong? Why does she always do this to me? So then you've got two of them running around like this, highly stressed and, and triggered through what's been happening in their workplace. And actually it starts um, flowing through the office. So by giving people the for what you need. So it could be a little bit extended. I'm feeling a bit stressed today. Um, my children are really sick. I just need everybody to have a little bit of patience with me. Oh, I just need people to understand. And that's really all you need to do. So when I'm being already still a little bit fragile and that person comes up to me and asks for the report and I go, I told you I will get them to you later. Well, probably I could have responded better, but that person has an informed choice to make and they can now say, I can either respond to that and get take it personally or I can have compassion and understand she's not in a good position, she's stressed. I'll just take that and it'll be okay. So you're actually helping your team be able to support each other in a much better way. The other thing that actually also does is from a management perspective, if you're listening into somebody turning up to the office frustrated, stressed or angry every single day and they're not able to move it, it allows you to take them aside and say, look, I've been noticing you've been saying you've been stressed for the last two weeks when you've been coming in or sad or, or unhappy. Um, I just want to see if I can help you through that. So contrary to what we've learned, um, having common values, common language and communicating well and sharing what's going on for you makes a huge difference in people feeling that they're in a safe space and they're not, they're not, and they know that they belong and they know that they're adding value to it. Um, so they are just sort of some of the tools I do use um, with families. I know there was probably a lot in that. I can probably send you some worksheets if you're interested. Um, but I think treating humans purely from a measurable KPI perspective and not supporting them in integrating and communicating better really does leave people open to a lot of pain. And um, we are all fragile humans after all, uh, we just sometimes forget. 
Thank you so much for sharing, Susanna. I think there may be a few people who will be using the puffer fish from now <laughs> on in the office going, before I go, I'm just going to let you know how things are. I think that's a, a great example.